Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, sir. They're not saying much. They were talking and they were shoving their face full of good food. Still up. As soon as we turn that on, everybody gets real quiet because nobody wants to hear themselves on the video. Uh, except me, I guess. Malachi chapter 4. Turn there in your Bible. We're closing out the book of Malachi tonight. We have been studying Malachi into the silence. Why did we call it into the silence? Because God was not going to send another prophet for some 400 years just prior to the coming of Christ. Prepare ye the way of the Lord is the theme of the book. And uh, we talked about that. We're going to talk more about it tonight as it, uh, the prophecy is about John the Baptist. And so we're talking some about that. Now, the key verse, we're going to read verses 4, 5, and 6, just three verses as we close this out. We started uh, to finish it out last week. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Verse 5, before that great and dreadful day of the Lord, as King James says. Uh, verse number 4 says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. You ought to underscore that in your Bible. The last uh, statements that God is making here before he closes out the Old Testament. Really important. Same with the last statements of the New Testament there in the book of the Revelation. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel. By the way, I said in passing um, the mount where uh, Moses got those tablets is called Sinai. That area we think is what they call Horeb because they used both. So the individual mount, Sinai, the area of mountains is Horeb. And so that's the reason there's, it says here, I commanded unto him in Horeb, that area. Uh, for all of Israel with statutes and judgment, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Very interesting. Um, as we begin our journey in this book uh, with this overall theme of preparing the way, uh, these people were living in the last days of revelation before Jesus would come. Very interesting time. And... Uh, since no more prophecy was going to be given and no prophet was going to be coming forth from the Lord, as I said, these are exceedingly important truths. Why is there going to be that time of silence? We learned that in this book. Well, the people in Israel just simply would not listen to what God had been saying. And after a while, uh, God had already taken them so many years, and God had uh, deposed kings. God would bless them. Um, he got to the place, uh, prophet after prophet came. He told the northern kingdom, especially through Isaiah, you need to turn around. If not, uh, you know, there's not going to be a blessing or be a curse. He got rid of the northern kingdom, just have Judah left. And then he had to send them off into captivity thinking, okay, uh, I'm tired of their adultery and I'm tired of their uh, idolatry. Uh, spiritual adultery as well as physical. I'm tired of them not living right and I'm tired of the... He sent them off to Babylon. Seventy years they came back. Remember Jerusalem was destroyed. Temple was destroyed. They rebuilt. God blessed them in miraculous ways. Watched over them. Sent them great prophets. And here we are again. Now the temple's been rebuilt, but they're not listening to what God is saying. Is it possible for the patience of God to wear out? He is long-suffering, but after a while, uh, God says, you know, I've got to do something and I'm going to do it. So God has decided that he is going to not send them a prophet, but Jesus is on the way. And he knows when the Lord's coming. But they're going to have some really years of struggle. Uh, we ought to do a, a, maybe a historical lesson sometimes, uh, several weeks in the intertestamental period. That would be a good study, and I may do that. Um, 
All of those days were difficult days, physically and spiritually. So much so, when Jesus came, when John the Baptist stepped on the scene and started preaching, people were responding, but how many people were really looking for the Messiah? Almost none. Religion was going along fine, but they were not looking. So we're living in the last days before the Lord returns again. There is not going to be any new revelation for us. God has closed the scripture. And uh, no new prophecy. There's no need for it. God has spoken, given us the great truths by which to live our lives. So there is a parallel between the ending of the Old Testament and the ending of this church age. Just how should these few believers left in the land of Israel be living before the Lord returns? Well, he is coming. Uh, behold, the day of the Lord coming. That's what Malachi had said. We'll talk a little more about that. How should we live in light of the Lord's return? Malachi gives us three directives. I'm going to give them to you tonight. They're real simple. Living in the light of his promise. Now, we know that God has promised. In fact, last week we used the same verse in 4 5, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the awesome day of God. Living in the light of his promise, how should we live? Now, we know that God has promised, Jesus promised to return. He said it. The angel said it when he left. He's coming back in like manner. You can count on that. It's the promise of God. Uh, we're living under that promise. He is coming one day. Well, first of all, expectation in the light of his promise. Through the years, they had lost all anticipation and all expectation for his coming. They said, you know, we've heard this all our life. Our forefathers told us about this stuff, but Messiah is coming. He's not come yet. They were getting discouraged, and, and they really had just set that aside. I mean, it had been so long, it seemed as if God was not coming. Uh, I'll read ESV because I like the translation of, of this in Peter. 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. Knowing this first of our day, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Remember that verse in Peter? Where ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And then I like the way they translate this because this is a little more exact. For they deliberately overlooked that fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water through the water by the word of God. The word of God, Peter says, is sure he's coming. Malachi said the word of God is sure. Behold, he coming. You can count on that. There's not many things you can count on. You can count on that. Uh, he is coming again. No doubt about it. But in these last days, similar to those last days, people are saying, well, I heard that all my life. Even in church, I've heard that since I was a kid. Uh, notice in verse number one, it is interesting as we started this chapter four, it is really interesting, for behold, the day cometh. Behold, God says, I want you to remember what he says there. I want you to remember my word. It means to reflect or to consider, to call into memory. Remember my word. Remember what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to do these things. You can count on them. So uh, we need to give close attention to the word of God living in the light of his promise. His word is sure so we know to read it. I believe there le there's less Bible reading today among believers in any time in history. In fact, we so dummy down, Sandy and I talked about this, we try to find uh, devotional programs. Most of them are so shallow, I just get frustrated. I, I knew that when I was first born again. It's hard to find anything with depth. And so she's reading now A.W. Tozer and Oswald Chambers, I think is what you've been doing. And uh, I've been listening to some old timers myself, and there's a couple of guys of years ago that I look at and listen to. It's hard to find anything of depth. It's even harder to find anything of reading depth. So I'm, I'm looking at devotions and reading your Bible. And you know, I love the Bible apps. I, I like that. It's, it's nice. You have them. 
but I've exhausted the 21 days. Most of them are three days. How to know the will of God? Three days. Now, God doesn't always move that quick, but we're so much in a hurry, we, don't, we want it in concise little bites. So I throw that out. I won't ask, uh, how much Bible reading are you doing? International Bible Readers Association reports that 85% of Christians have never been through the entire Bible. That's a pretty good chunk. Uh, uh, why is that? A poll said the following. I like the poll. Uh, why is that? 48% laziness. They said they were just too lazy or lacked discipline to do it. 44% said they lacked the time. 6% said they don't understand what they're reading. That's not very many. 2% uh, they said, well, they don't have real good reading skills. So 85% uh, have never read through the Bible. Maybe you never have. Maybe it's time you sat down and figured out, okay, I'm going to read through this year. It takes me two years. That's fine. I'm going to read my Bible every day. This is the basics of Christian living, <clears throat> reading your Bible. But we kind of get away from that. And what's interesting in, my, in our day is people want to read what somebody says about the Bible more than they want to read the Bible. So you get this hot book off the press that somebody wrote by a ghostwriter. I still saying most of these big guys don't write them. They have somebody else write them because I have some friends of mine that write for some. And they put their name on it. They look it over and put their name on it. And they sell it and you buy it and say, boy, he's wonderful. That guy can really write. Well, he probably didn't write it. Most of them don't anymore. Uh, you can't do what the Word says unless you know it. It's our manual as a believer. Now, it's not what somebody says about it. It's what the Word says. And the Holy Spirit will help you understand it. Amen. So how do we live in life? Well, his word is sure to read it. So Malachi is saying, look, he's coming, the promise. You ought to just lay hold of the promises God's given Israel. You can count on the Messiah coming from Judah. The line of the tribe of Judah is coming. His word is sure. So the word means to reflect upon it here. You know, we need to learn to spend some time thinking about what God has written. What's God say? Uh, did you ever get a message from somebody and you look at it and you say, now, I want to read through this because this is important. This is an important message. Not like it is when you buy a house and you've got 14,000 papers and after a while you're signing them. You don't know what you signed. Uh, you just, you got tired of signing. Your hand hurts and they say, oh, here's another one. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, if it's real important, uh, you know, I signed all those papers about uh, HUD and all the rest of stuff. I didn't get a HUD loan. But when it came down to the money and how much I had to pay every month and all this kind of stuff, I paid attention to that paper. Wait a minute. Let me look at this. This one's important. It's not that important about all of the other rules and regulations. Um, Eugene Peterson, who actually translated the message, I like his statement on this. Christian reading is a participatory reading, receiving the words in such a way that they become interior to our lives inside. The rhythms, the images become practices of prayer, acts of obedience, and ways to love. I love that. Get it inside of you. It is what makes our life. So the psalmist said, Psalm 1, First couple of verses. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, and no one standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. His delight, verse 2, is in what? The law of the Lord. And in his law doth he reflect or meditate on day and night, thinking about what God has said. Uh, truth is something that must be known with the mind and then has to be accepted in the heart and then put into practice in the life. You first have to take it in. You know it, you accept it in your heart, and you begin to practice it in your life. So expectation of the light of his promise. His word is sure, his word is sure. Not only read it, but reflect upon it. Then there is interpretation of the truth of his promise. Now, this is interesting. Verse 5 says, Behold, I will, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The first question was this in their interpretation. Is Elijah coming back to life personally? So God gives him a promise. He is going to send one to prepare the way, and this one, Elijah. This uh, follows up in chapter 3, verse 1, what he'd already revealed. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, saith the Lord, whom you see. 
shall suddenly come to his temple, the Lord, even the messenger of the covenant. So he said, hey, I'm going to send someone to prepare the way for the Messiah who's coming. Elijah, of course, was the great prophet that appears on the scene suddenly from the wilderness. I don't know where he came from. Just comes walking out of the wilderness. God has spoken to him, uh, dresses in that uh, strange way, a rough guy, and uh, his departure is just as abrupt. He has an unusual department, uh, departure. He goes up in a whirlwind, a chariot and whirlwind. Up. He doesn't go through the normal channel of death. His message and mission of Elijah was to call Israel back to God and the covenant they'd made with God in the midst of such a wicked and perverse nation led by Ahab and Jezebel. You remember all that. And his conflict with them and the uh, leaders of Baal and all of that uh, conflict on Mount Carmel. Uh, God is calling people back to him. So they were believing Elijah would appear personally so is that what that means? There's some today that still believe, we'll talk about that in a moment, that they believe that Elijah's coming back personally. Well, let's talk about this prophetically because we have a little further scripture on this. I want to share this with you. Prophetic passages are sometimes surrounded with something that might not be literal. And that's every group knows that. If you study anything about prophecy, part of it is God didn't want you to know what's happening until it happens. He didn't give you every detail. Well, uh, Elijah was coming ideally, but not physically. How do we know this? This simply means, by the way, that one would come to represent the office of the prophet Elijah and have the same spirit and power. He's coming in that prophetic office, but is it Elijah himself? He'd be the same kind of dynamic messenger as Elijah. So, uh, it's interesting, in these last days, some premillennialists, and, and uh, they may be right, but there's no reason to believe this, but they believe and hold that John the Baptist did not fully fulfill the promise here, and uh, it's probably fulfilled in Revelation 11, the two witnesses, one of them is Elijah, the other one thinks Moses. You can believe that if you want to, but I think with this prophecy about Elijah, we have to look at some truth. One, uh, the angelic message, Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Two, uh, his mother, and he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He lies as a transliteration, not a translation. Names don't translate, they just transliterate, so the spelling's a little different. Uh, you know that because uh, you'll be listening to the Japanese or whatever, and they'll go, uh, Joe Biden. I mean, Oh, okay, I got that, because names don't translate, so you'll understand it. He should go before him in the spirit of power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers and the children and the disobedient the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. When the angel said that to Zacharias, he is quoting what we have in Malachi. He is connect, The angel of God connects it. So then we go to the statement made by Jesus in uh Mark, uh, Matthew eleven fourteen, the forceful preaching that the Baptist was doing, preaching repentance and faith, was a realization of the prophecy of Malachi. And if you will receive it, this is Elias. This is Elias, which was for to come. Jesus said, if, if you will receive that, or some translate it, if you're willing to accept it, that's a good translation, if you're willing to accept it, this is that prophecy's fulfillment. Well, in answer to the disciples' question in Matthew 17, uh, Jesus said this, and his disciples asked him, saying, Why then, say the scribes, that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listened. He's talking about John the Baptist, right? Likewise, Shall the Son of Man suffer for them? The disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. He said, the fulfillment of that prophecy is going to take place in John the Baptist. So they asked old John, you remember they got John aside, and they said, hey, uh, who are you? This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem asking him, who are you? He's preaching, they don't like it, he's baptizing folks. And his message is to 
repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is about to come. He's going to start his ministry. As soon as Jesus' ministry started, John the Baptist said, he's got to increase. I've got to decrease. I've done my job. Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but uh, confessed, I'm not the Christ. See, they said, you Messiah? No. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, he didn't say he wasn't the, came in the power of Elijah. He said, no, I'm not him. In other words, they said, are you are you literally Elijah that's come back to life? No. And are you the prophet? He's talking about the one the prophet Moses talked about in Deuteronomy that would come before the Lord. No, I'm not any of those, but uh, I'm the forerunner. So in, in all of this, we see the fulfillment of this prophecy with John the Baptist. He came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, will Elijah be one of the two witnesses? Maybe, but we don't have anything else to go on. Uh, so, John was not Elijah himself. His drafts, by the way, and his lifestyle and his diet and ministry were very similar to Elijah. You know, come out of the wilderness, preach repentance, shook up things, challenged people, ended up being beheaded. I mean, he was a tough preacher. And he said to Philip, you got something, you got your brother's wife, and that ain't right. I mean, boy, he got in trouble, didn't he? And he preached. He, he called them all kinds of things. Vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Uh, that's good preaching, isn't it? How would you like me Sunday to call you a bunch of snakes? <laughs> Not you folks online. Uh, no, but think about that. Boy, he was laying it on. Hey, uh, what's the preparation we should make in light of this promise? God in this passage gives a divine challenge. He is going to come personally. Uh, the Lord is coming. So the challenge is to live in, in the light of his coming. Verse 6, interesting statement. Last verse, uh, he should turn the heart of the fathers to the children. The, the fathers are the godly men and women of the past ever who paved the way for the children. This present generation of believers who know that the Messiah is coming. He said, your forefathers were faithful you know that they were true. He is coming. He should turn the heart of the children to their fathers. In other words, Jesus is coming. When he comes, he is going to fulfill the promise. And guess what? They didn't recognize that this great Gentile work, but think about the church age and what's going on since Jesus came. Think about all the people saved, including you and I. Wow. Throughout history. So he is sending a preacher in his love for Israel before the Messiah is to come before the day of judgment to preach uh, to Israel. And it's, uh, he's doing that to turn around lest he has to smite him. What did Israel do when Jesus came? The Baptist said he's coming. He preached repentance and people came out and were getting baptized and they said, are you the Messiah? No, are you? No. And then Jesus, they said, are you he? Yeah. And Israel said, we don't want him. We'd rather have that crook, that thief named Barabbas, take him away, get rid of him. And in light of that, God said, Romans 11, God said, I'm breaking off the natural branches. I'm grafting in the unnatural branches, Gentiles. Church today is primarily Gentile. When he comes again, it's going to become primarily Jewish again, his work. But uh, that's the message. So what does it mean to us? Since we know God keeps his promises, maybe it would be good for us to be reminded of what he said in chapter 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He said, look, I'm going to send somebody before him, and but suddenly the Lord's going to show up. You can count on him. And he's not going to give you a lot of warning. He's coming. So Jesus said, watch therefore, Matthew 25, 13, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Well, how about uh, Colossians 16, or Corinthians 16, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. How about 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let's watch and be sober. Pay attention. We know God's word. He is coming. But the end of all things, Peter said, 4-7 of 1 
of 1 Peter. The end of all things is at hand. There so will be you sober, wide awake, paying attention, and watch unto prayer. Um, tomorrow morning, the Lord, uh, if he continues another day, the sun is going to rise over Jerusalem. It did today. I was in the hotel. Happened to be facing the east last time I was in the east room. And I watched that sunrise. I get up early and the time was messed up, but I got up because I woke up uh, way before daylight and I watched that sun come up over the old city. We could see that. Beautiful sight. Just, I was looking out the window of the sun and then I could look out the other corner and see part of the, of the city. The Jews are wailing at the western wall. I've seen that. Just across from Temple Mount. Eastern gate, the other side of the mount, closed concrete it up. You see it there. Nobody can enter it. They're waiting for the Messiah every day. Just a little walk outside the gates, not too far. Uh, if you go out the Sheep Gate, where there's the old city, there is a uh, rock face. It is a place of the skull. There's a garden tomb. We think it's a place where Jesus lay. It's a beautiful, tranquil place today. And you can poke your head inside and look, and there's a shelf there. And it's a very uh, awe-inspiring place. They built a little chapel. There's flowers everywhere. We had a service both times I was there in the chapel. People go there to see, but I can tell you for sure, there ain't nobody in that tomb. And Jesus is not where they laid him. We think that's the place for sure. But he's not in the ground. He's living and he's coming back. The question is, are you ready? You see, if Malachi tells us anything, it tells us this. Be ready because my promise is true. Jesus could come at any moment. And I'll say to this to those online too. You better make sure you're ready. He's coming. You can count on him. And we need to be looking for him each and every day. Hey, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this uh, last lesson in Malachi. We ask your blessing uh, upon the continued studies in the future. Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to be wide awake. Help us not to slumber spiritually, uh, but to be looking for your return. For you have promised to come again. And that promise is sure. I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime. We're getting off close. But Lord, you're coming soon. And we know you are coming. So if it's a year or 10 years or 100 years, a 1,000 years, we don't know. We believe it's going to be very soon because of the atmosphere of the age. But we do know this. You are coming. Help each one to be prepared. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.